Here we are. Okay. So during the last uh, group of lectures we had uh, last week, uh, we introduced uh, a microscopic model for the polarizability of media. Professor? Yeah? I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. We introduced the model that accounts for the polarizability of the solid media and also liquid media. And then with some few passages, we described uh, just a while, okay. We uh, found out uh, that this makes that the refractive index of a material depends on the frequency and on the wavelength. Uh, you remember here in these two curves that you see here, um, the green curve is representing the dependency of the real part of the refractive index with respect to frequency. And this model says to you that if the harmonic oscillator has got a resonance at frequency capital omega, around this resonance, the refractive index has got an S-like behavior. So it is increasing when you approach the resonance frequency, then it decreases to a lower value and then it grows again. And the, the imaginary Excuse part- Excuse me, Professor, the, your voice is not clear. Like this, can you hear me? It's a little weak. Uh, bo both of you cannot hear me. I can hear you. Yes, so, I can. So could you try to increase the volume of your speakers? And we see whether you can hear. Is it okay like this? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and uh, also the imaginary part of the refractive index, kappa, has got a resonance at this frequency capital omega. Now, it comes out that most of transparent material that you have in nature, they, have, they can be modeled as a, a set of oscillators with a capital omega frequency that is in the ultraviolet region. That means that in the visible regions, so for frequencies that are lower than the frequency corresponding to the ultraviolet, or for wavelengths that are longer than the wavelength that is corresponding to ultraviolet, the refractive index is a decreasing function of the wavelength. And uh, we gave this graph on the right hand side that shows you that the refractive index decreases with wavelength generically. Okay? And you see what we told in the laboratory during the last lab work that is the larger it is the refractive index of a medium, say for example, lantanum, vent, flint, uh, glass, the larger it is the dispersion. The pink region here is the visible range. So you see there is a very strong change of the refractive index in the visible range. And if you take, for example, a fluorite crown glass, this has got a very low refractive index and consequently the dispersion is very low. That is the why 
the ladies like so much the diamond, okay? They like the diamond because diamond has got a refractive index that is about three in the visible. It is very large. That means that it is able to disperse chromatically light in a very efficient way. That is when you have a diamond and light gets inside the diamond, when it is reflected uh, multiple, uh, more than once inside the diamond and comes out, the colors are divided in the spectrum, uh, in the spectrum. And that is the why you like them. And that is the why you cannot have the same quality brilliance uh, with, for example, zirconium, uh, zirconia uh, gems, okay? So the larger it is the refractive index in average, the stronger it is the dispersion. This is what you have to expect, okay? Now, uh, we just give a very, 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 very qualitative uh, um, description. If instead of using uh, a classical oscillator model, you refer to what you have learned in quantum mechanics, then you know that uh, an atom, a molecule, or also a solid can be characterized by some energetic level. And then when you study in quantum mechanics, the energy levels, these are quantized, okay? That means that you may have a, a ground state for your material. And in the, this is the state where the electron is living in uh, stationary conditions. And that there are several excited states that can be named A, B, C, and so on. And that if you want to uh, transit from one energy state to uh, another energy state, you need to give to your material this energy, and you have to give at least the difference in energy between two states. So you have to, if you want to go from G to A, you must go, you must give some energy. And normally you give this energy as quanta, H bar omega GA, it is the uh, frequency corresponding to that transition. So in quantum mechanics, what we was in classical mechanics, the resonance frequency is the energy transition between two levels, okay? Now, uh, of course, if you have a molecule, you can calculate the states by using the Schrodinger equation. We don't do that, okay? And uh, if you want to study interaction of a molecule with light, so say that you have light with photons that have got energy H bar omega GA, then these photons can promote the molecule from the ground state to an excited state. The interaction is governed by um, an interaction Hamiltonian that is very difficult to calculate and so on and so on. We don't lose time about this, okay? By this Hamiltonian. Now, it comes out that if in quantum mechanics, you calculate the polarizability, and this is where I want to get the polarizability of a molecule, then in quantum mechanics, you find out that the polarizability is given by a sum all over the state, and this uh, uh, bracket description, what are they? This G mu A, these quantities that are here, G mu A, this is the expected value for the operator mu between the state G and the state A. So it is the expectation value. And this mu is the dipole moment of the molecule. And you have here, you see, 
the, the reverse a mu g, so this is the, the square modulus of g mu a. But what is important for us is that you get in quantum mechanics a general expression like this. What is important is that in the denominator of sphere, they appear some different frequencies between the frequency of your light and the frequency corresponding to a transition between these two levels. Now, we don't mind about the details, but what we understand is that when the small omega in the denominator gets equal to capital omega AG, then the denominator is minimum and you have a resonance. So also in quantum mechanics, you have that the polarizability is resonantly enhanced when you have a frequency that is close to a transition uh, energy between two energy levels. Okay? So the classical model that we gave here above, based on the resonance frequency of an oscillator, what is the resonance frequency in quantum mechanics? Is the transition frequency between two energy levels. Given that glasses have this transition energy in the ultraviolet, they behave uh, the, the way we have shown above. Okay? We don't tell more than this. This is just a, a very quick uh, qualitative uh, description, but it can be done completely we, if you uh, study a bit more the quantum mechanical problem. Okay? And this is the first thing that we say to conclude this part of the program. The other thing that I want to tell you is the following, that in physics, there are some relations that are named the Kramer-Kronig relations. And the, this relation says to you that if you have a so-called response function, here, in our case, the response function is the dielectric constant. And why we call it the response function? Because you apply an electric field, the material is polarized, and it responds to the application of an electric field. How much does it respond? It is written in the dielectric constant, okay? If the dielectric constant has got a real and, Im and an imaginary part, epsilon sub r and epsilon sub t, then it is always true that if you know the, the frequency dependency of the imaginary part for all frequencies, okay, then by calculating this integral in the complex plane, you can evaluate the real part. So if you know how we sit the imaginary part all over the frequency spectrum from zero to infinity, then you calculate as epsilon sub r. And if you know the real part by calculating this integral, you can calculate the imaginary part. So the imaginary and real part of the response function are not independent from each other. They are dependent, of course, the value at a certain frequency of the real part depends on the values of to all frequencies of the imaginary part. Now, this is true for the dielectric constant, but this is also true for any response function in physics. That means if in electronics you have a, an amplifier that is amplifying a current say an operational amplifier, and it is characterized by a transfer function that has got real and imaginary parts, these two parts must be connected by the kramer kronig relation. This is true in nuclear physics, this is true in biology, this is true always when you have a response function, okay? So in principle, if you know the real part of the refractive index because you measured it all over the spectrum 
then you can calculate the imaginary part, so the kappa coefficient, all over the spectrum and the reverse. So from a measurement of the real part, you can evaluate the, the imaginary part. Of course, you need to know the refractive index all over the spectrum. So you have to measure it everywhere. And this is, this is the second, say, uh, note that I give at the end of this part. Again, this is qualitative. This is for your future. Always keep it in mind. This Kramer Kroenig relation. Okay. Kroenig is the Dutch man who invented the, the Kroenig delta. Okay. He has been a great man in quantum mechanics. And uh, after Kroenig, there was another important physicist who was Dirac in English, and he invented the, the Dirac delta. Both of these uh, things are used in quantum mechanics. And with this, we end with this part of the course, this uh, part uh, devoted to summary of optics and electromagnetism, and we do not add anything else. What we shall add will be the content of the next laboratory work. So during the next laboratory work, you will uh, have to work on the Fresnel formulas, and then you will have to make a measurement and to understand how to fit it, okay? It is not necessary you study again the Fresnel formulas for next Thursday, because we shall give you a piece of paper with everything written on top, okay? That you are confident. Uh. Now, so we can, uh, go to the next group of lectures. That is named uh, some characteristics of the electronic structure of organic molecules and absorption spectroscopy. So we start the part of the course that is really related to biophotonics, okay? And we need to give a small introduction, first of all. We told at the beginning of the course that if you want to study a living tissue, these are uh, uh, slices of a living tissue that are 10 micron thick that lay on top of a microscope slide and you're watching them with a microscope, with an optical microscope, okay? Now, if you don't stain your sample, you don't color your sample with any type of uh, coloring agents, in the optical microscope, you wouldn't see anything. Why don't you see anything when you study a material? Now we know. Because the living tissues, they are constituted by 90% or more of water. You have some tiny membranes that are made out of lipids, but these are very small. So in principle, when you pass from the internal part of a tissue here to the external part of a tissue here, you are always in water and the refractive index is the same. So when you study with the optical microscope a material like this, you have light that is going through a material that is non-homogeneous, but in the refractive index changes are very small. You are always with a refractive index that is of the order of 1.33. Now you know, because you saw it in the lab, okay? So when light is passing through your material, refraction is very weak and you don't see much, okay? If you use an optical microscope to study gallium arsenide, uh, uh, features on top of glass, clearly 
since the refractive index of gallium arsenide and glass are much different, there is a lot of refraction and you will see strong changes in transmittance. Here you don't see much. So you are obliged, if you want to study living materials, you are obliged to use something that is changing the color of your material. And here it is what you used until 70, 80 years ago. That is, you color with different molecules that like to enter inside the nucleus, for example, the hematoxylin that goes into the nuclei and the eosin that goes into the cytoplasm. And by watching the two colors, you can distinguish what is the nucleus and what is the cytoplasm of the cell, okay? Well, in this, what are you doing? You are using molecules that are absorbing light. And so light is not transmitted and you see a dark spot where you have the molecules or a color spot, clear? Now, this process has been undertaken, uh, overtaken during the last uh, 70 years because now you don't use any more molecules that are only absorbing. You are using molecules that are absorbing light and then are fluorescing. They are emitting light. So in this figure, for example, the nucleus was uh, um, labeled with a so-called DAPI molecule, DAPI molecule that is absorbing light and emitting in the blue. And so the blue is the emission of the uh, molecules. The mitochondria have been labeled with a molecule that is emitting in the red. And the cytoskeleton that is made out of actin is marked with a molecule that is emitting in green, okay? So you are not anymore uh, measuring uh, absorption in your medium, but you are measuring how much light is emitted by your molecules, okay? Clearly, to do this, you need to use molecules to color your sample or to stain, as we say, your sample that are compatible with the living tissues. You cannot use uh, silicon, you cannot use gallium arsenide because these are poisonous to the body, okay? So you need to use organic molecules. And therefore, it is very important that we understand how or an organic molecule is absorbing light and how an organic molecule is emitting light, okay? That is the reason why in this part, of the course, we study some characteristics of the electronic structure of organic molecules. At the very end of this part, we shall give some description of quantum dots that are out of inorganic materials, but this, is, this will be very, very, very short, okay? Uh, consider that organic molecules are used in all uh, types of microscopies that are based on fluorescence, on the emission of light, okay? And for example, you find them in conventional fluorescence microscopy, in confocal microscopy, but you will find these molecules also in the most advanced optical microscopies that we shall describe. And therefore, we, start from here and we resume what I said, that usually the molecules that are used to sustain the biological tissues, the proteins or DNA fragments are organic dyes. These are organic molecules based on carbon chemistry, okay? As a consequence, this part of the course will be devoted to describe the mechanisms that govern the interaction of an organic molecule with electromagnetic radiation, light, in particular absorption and emission of light. And when we speak of light, we speak of visible light because in the microscope, normally you want to watch with your eyes. This is not completely true because in modern microscopes you have cameras 
and you can operate also in the ultraviolet and the near infrared. So, but always close to the infrared to the visible range. And uh, we will address by the end of the course metals and nano semiconducting and particles. Now, and we try to resume. very quickly what you do expect. Uh, you studied in your previous studies, probably, I believe you did in this nanotechnology course, the quantum levels of atoms, okay? So you know that if you create, if you have an atom, this will be characterized by energy levels that are quantized and that, that follow certain rules, okay? Now, if you're a molecule, this will be constituted by many uh, nuclei and many electrons that guarantee the bonds between the, the, the atoms. And uh, also molecules are characterized by quantum states. So, and uh, these quantum states, they have got energies that are associated to the motion of the charges. In particular, the vibration and the rotation. Okay. Uh, the energy levels or molecules um, can be, they have got contributions that have an electronic origin, a vibrational origin, a rotational origin, and a spin contribution. So, in general, you the energy level of a molecule depends on the electronic configuration of the electrons, on the vibrational state, on the rotational state, and on the spin state. Okay. Now, in a very first approximation, one can say that the energy state, the energy of a molecule, when you are in a given state, can be. Uh, written as the sum of contributions that are from the electronics motion of the electron, from the vibration, from the rotational, and from the spin contribution. Now, it comes out that these energy contributions are very well separated from each other. So the range of the electronic energies the and the range of the vibrational energies, they are well divided. And the same for the other contribution. And that the electronic contribution is larger than the contribution due to vibration, that is larger than the contribution due to rotations, that is larger than the contribution due to spin. Okay? Now, therefore, when you have a molecule, an organic molecule, you can sketch its energy diagram and say that there is a ground state here, okay? And there is an excited state, okay? We will go a bit more in detail uh, later on. We call these states electronic states. So when you have a molecule, the electrons that take part to the bonds are distributed around the molecule, they form molecular orbitals, and one electron in this molecular orbital has got an energy, okay? If you have an electron in a molecular orbital, it can jump to a larger energy molecular orbital, say from the ground state to an excited state, and typically this jump from one configuration of the electronic cloud to another configuration of the electronic cloud, typically this jump has an energy difference that is in the order of two, three electron volts, okay? Remember, how much is it an electron volt? An electron volt is the charge of the electron in joule. So one electron volt is 1.6 10 to the minus 19 joule okay and corresponds to 
an energy in the units used by the chemists if you speak with chemists and you speak about uh, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy they will speak we tell you that this energy translation corresponds to about 8065 inverse of centimeters okay now so this transition between the case in which one electron of the molecule it is in the ground state to the configuration where the electron is in an excited state takes about two three electron volts but remember that one photon in the red range so if you have red light and you think that red light is constituted by photons the photons of red light have an energy that is of the order of two electron volts Okay, so red light corresponds to two electron volts. Each photon has got two electron volts. So two is in the range of the visible light in red wavelength, and three electron volts is in the range of ultraviolet already. It's already ultraviolet. Okay, but now the electron that is in the ground state uh, may have a uh, may stay in a certain uh, configuration of the electronic cloud but the energy of this state the electron can stay here or even it can have a bit larger energy or a bit larger energy what is due to this is due to the fact that the nuclei can vibrate okay so for example if you have a, a molecule that is in a ground state and it is not vibrating that means that the electron is in the ground state and it is not vibrating you will stay in this level here but even if you remain in the same electronic cloud the same configuration of the electron but the molecule is vibrating a bit if it is vibrating a bit you can have a bit more of energy and you can occupy this level here or a larger level here so and this vibrational contribution is of the order of 10 to 300 milli electron volts that means between 0 0.01 and 0 0.3 electron volts so you see that there is a net separation between this spacing here and this spacing here okay so if you, you are uh, you do expect that if you watch carefully one vibronic level here and you, you study the energy here with a bit more of the resolution you will find out that this energy level here of these two energy levels here if you increase your resolution each of these vibrational levels is split in sub levels and this splitting is due to rotation of the molecule so the molecule can also rotate okay and the, the energy spacing due to rotation or the contribution of two energy due to rotation you see here is in between 0.3 and one milli electron volt so even much lower than before so the rotational spacing smaller than the vibrational spacing that it is here and if you would study with even more detail the rotational levels you would see that there is a spin contribution and the spin contribution is even smaller in the order of micro electron volt okay so in general a molecule can have an energy that depends on it electronics electronic configuration the configuration of the electron on its vibrational configuration on its rotational configuration and on the spin configuration now before studying 
this here. Let's watch this um, this uh, uh, graph here. Uh, we described electromagnetic radiation, okay? And here you have uh, electro the frequency and the uh, all, I mean, the theory that we reviewed about electromagnetic waves is true for frequencies that are going from say 10 to the uh, 6 hertz to 10 to the 18 hertz okay and uh, when you are in between 10 to the 6 10 to the 8 you are in the so-called radio radio range okay your cellular phone is working at about 1.8 gigahertz, 1.8, 10 to the nine hertz, you are here, more or less, okay? If you increase the frequency here, you go in the so-called far infrared range. So at this frequency here, you are in the far, far infrared. If you go here, you are in the so-called near infrared range, at this frequency. If you go in, the, in between these two dashed lines here, okay, you are in the so-called visible range. And the visible range here is enlarged. So this is zoomed. This spectrum should be in between these two dashed lines here. And the, the frequency is so large that you don't speak anymore about frequency, but you speak of wavelengths, okay? And so the radiation corresponding to red is 700 nanometers and you decrease the wavelength and you reach the violet in 400 nanometers and this is the spectrum if you increase even more uh, the frequency you will go to larger frequencies until when you reach the region of the x rays and gamma rays particles you don't speak anymore of electromagnetic waves, but when you are at such frequency, you speak of hard photons, particles, okay? And uh, of course, you can study uh, the spectrum of uh, electromagnetic radiation in terms of frequency or in terms of wavelength or in terms of photon energy. And then you see that here, the visible range is in the range of two, three electron volts, more or less hard photons they have 10 to the 6 electron volts so mega electron volts and radio waves they have got micro electron volts as energy and so on now look where are the typical where is the typical spacing between electronic levels laying so this spacing that we sorry this spacing here, the spacing here between electronic levels, two, three electron volts, where does it fall? It falls in the visible range. So when you have visible light that is interacting with the molecule, very likely visible light will make that one electron is promoted from a ground electronic state to an excited electronic state. Okay, where are the vibrational levels playing? They are in a wavelength range in the order of 10 to the four nanometer. That means 10 microns, okay? This is the typical wavelength uh, that is uh, associated to vibration. So if you have light with such frequencies, this light will interact with the vibrational transitions. Where are the rotational uh, spacing uh, uh, in, in wavelength? They are in the range of 10 to the 10 hertz, okay, 10 gigahertz, and uh, with wavelengths of the order of 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 nanometers. Okay, so long, long wavelength. And the spin transitions, they are in the range of, of uh, say, uh, wavelength 10 to the 10, 10 to the 9 nanometers. That means of the order of one meter. Okay. Now that is the why. 
when you have a microwave oven in your kitchen, you open the microwave, you put a chicken inside, and then you switch on the way the microwave way. What are you doing? You are switching on a generator of radio frequency in the order of 10 gigahertz. You are generating radiation at 10 gigahertz inside the chamber. And this radiation will interact with the rotational uh, transitions. So it will make water rotate inside your chicken. This rotation is transferred by dissipation to kinetic energy. This will produce heat and heat and cook your chicken. Okay? So in microwave waves, you are using such type of frequency. And then you realize that we, when you use your cellular phone and using next to your ear and next to your brain, it is as if you would put your head inside a microwave oven. No? And that must conceive a bit you. There must be some effect. It is clearly, it has not been yet demonstrated, but you should at least think that it can be. Okay. So these are the range, ranges. And if you increase very much the energy and you go to very large frequencies, then you get light that is so energetic that it can photo dissociate your molecule, can destroy your molecule, can take electrons out of the molecule, ionize and break the bonds. Okay. Now in our course, we, will, we always work in the visible range. So we will have radiation, visible light that is able to induce transitions between electronic levels. Okay. Now, I need to watch my to just tell this concept. Yes, just we tell uh, the concept. Now, the transition between two energy levels can be associated to the absorption or to the emission of a photon with an energy that is given by the difference of the energies of the two levels, okay? So if you have a molecule with two energy levels and the molecule is in this state here, you can excite the molecule to a larger energy by sending a photon which has got an energy that is H nu that must be equal to difference between the two energy level. This is named the Fermi golden rule from our physicist Fermi in the thirties. Okay. And be careful. It is not like in classical mechanics. That means that if your energy the energy of the photon is lower than the energy spacing, there will not be any absorption. The energy is not enough. If the energy is exactly equal to the energy difference, there will be absorption. So the molecule will be excited. But if the energy of the photon is larger than the energy difference, it, there will not be any transition because the photon must have an energy that is, must be equal to the energy difference, not larger, like in classical mechanics, okay? This process here is named absorption. So when we say that a molecule is absorbing, we mean that is a molecule interacting with light absorbs one photon and goes from a, a energy level to an upper energy level okay the second process you can study is the so-called spontaneous emission what is spontaneous emission think that you have a molecule that has been excited to an excited level so it has an energy that is larger than the ground state energy we know in physics that there is a general principle 
that says that systems try to occupy the lowest energy possible level, okay? So the molecule will stay in the excited state for some time, and then it will relax to the ground state and will emit a photon that has got an energy that is exactly equal to the energy difference, okay? Now, this spontaneous emission process is a completely stochastic problem, uh, process. So there is the time when the molecule will relax is not at all defined. It will relax when she wants, okay? So there is no uh, uh, connection, so it's a pure statistical process, okay? There is another process that is named stimulated emission. This was introduced by Einstein in the Annus Mirabilis 1905, when he proposed the five uh, wonderful articles that then gave him the, the Nobel. These were five silver separate Nobel prizes. But, and he said, but look, there is another process. This is named stimulated emission. And in stimulated emission, what does it happen? If you have a molecule that is in an excited state, then if you get a photon with exactly the same energy uh, the, of the, the equal to the difference of the energies of the two levels, this photon will trigger the emission of energy. So will uh, force the molecule to emit another photon. Okay? So the molecule will relax and you have the original photon plus a new photon that is emitted. Now, this process here is deterministic problem process. It happens when the trigger photon arrives, okay? So, spontaneous emission is a statistic process. Stimulated emission is not. Now, what is the um, inverse of absorption, is it spontaneous emission or is it stimulated emission? The inverse of absorption is stimulated emission, the inverse process. Think that until 1905, nobody knew that there was spontaneous emission. And after that it was clear, the basics for lasers was there laser was invented 50 years later okay now second uh, uh, comment spontaneous emission is an isotropic process what does it mean if you have an excited molecule it can emit light in any direction top, bottom, right, left, front, back, any combination. So it will emit with the same probability in every direction. Stimulated emission is a directional process. What does it mean? If you have a photon coming from the left, the second photon will be emitted along the same direction together with the original photon, okay? Third observation, the stimulated emission process is coherent. What does it mean? It means that if you think that the in the stimulated emission, the input photon is an electromagnetic wave, the, em, the em, photon that is emitted by stimulated emission is an electromagnetic wave that is in phase with the original wave. So they sum up in phase, okay? While the spontaneous emission is given that it is a statistical process, there is no correlation on phase. Now, the, let me, the theory that is in the back of these processes is was uh, made by Fermi when he studied the interaction of electromagnetic radiation with an atom. And the theory 
is valid under an approximation that is the so-called dipole approximation. So your atom is modeled as an oscillating dipole, if you wish, as an quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay. And in this approximation, not all transitions between energy levels are permitted, but there are some selection rules. So when you study interaction of a molecule with light, not all transition between electronic levels can be excited by light. Okay. And we shall try to discuss a bit this. So, So this sketch here describes interaction of a molecule with light, so with an electromagnetic radiation. But molecules can transit from one energy level to another energy level also by means of other types of interaction. For example, if you heat your material, if, if you give energy in terms of heat, where KB is the Boltzmann constant and T is the absolute temperature, then if you can promote a molecule from the from a, uh, from a low state to a high state. Say the same here, a molecule can release energies, energy in terms of heat. Okay. Or you can excite a molecule by collision. For example, you can send a particle towards a molecule, a muon, a proton, a neutron, whatever, a neutrino, whatever, you can promote the molecule to an upper level by collision. Or if you have a molecule, it can collide uh, over the wall of, uh, of the container. If you have a gas, for example, a gas particle can collide with a wall and it can be excited during the collision. All these processes have no selection rule. So you can pass from any state to any state and there are no selection rules, okay? Now, we can stop here for 10 minutes, quarter of an hour, and then we start again, okay? Are there any questions? No, we stop here and then in a quarter of an hour, we go ahead.